So here we are, 2016 is behind us. 2017 lies ahead. So what typically happens with a lot of people, me being one of them, I come up with, I wouldn't call them New Year's resolutions, but what I do is I, I look at my past year and I see my, my failures and things that might, be, uh, might have had success in, and, and I want to do better than what the things I did good at, and, and the failures, I, I just plain want a redo button. Anybody feel like you ever want, you want to reset? This is reset. Today, as one of my old bosses told me, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And I tell my kids that all the time when they're having a bad time. I said, right now, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Let's make it count. Uh, let's, let's make it good. But I have these, these, these New Year commitments. Uh, one of them I have this year is my, I'll just tell you, it's my physical body. Because what, what happened over the past year is I ate a lot. And I had to admit, I was, t- I, listen, I can only eat so much broccoli and kale is disgusting. You know what kale tastes like? I used to mow lawns many years ago. It tastes like you mowed lawn, you got the stinky grass out, you put it in a glass into a blender, and you drank it, and you said, mmm, isn't that delicious? It's not delicious. It tastes like you mowed a lawn, and you're drinking it. It's not good. So, but anyway, so what happened is in 2016, I, I decided, I had to admit the truth, I like food. There is a lot of food that I like, and I ate, and I ate. Went to the gym when I felt like it. You know, that kind of thing. And, and you know, it starts causing, in my case, it can cause some physical complications. So I realized, you know, 2017, I have got to get this right. And I really tried. So I, I mentioned this first service, right? After first service, I'm walking around on the courtyard, and Panera Bread has their bread out there. Because any of you see that? Okay, so one of the ladies, bless her heart, she said, there is a secret stash back here. Do you want to see it? I thought, yeah, I was looking for jalapeno cheese bread, but there wasn't any. But she opened up this box, and in the blo- box was this blueberry scone with sugar all over it. And then one of the other gals, Sharon, is in there. She had sat in for service. She said, uh-uh, close the box. Uh-uh-uh, you just said you're going to eat good in 2017. Why? Why? So, anyways, the accountability, I guess was good. So I didn't get any of it. Not yet. yet. (laughs) When nobody's looking. You know why there's a light in your refrigerator? So you can see at midnight what you're about to eat. That's why there's a light in my refrigerator anyways. But in all seriousness, the, the, the physical commitments are sometimes, I believe they're necessary. My body is made by the Lord and I need to take better care of it. And, and, you know, I, I look and I didn't take good care of my body in 2016. I expect to do better in 2017. But my, way more important than that, much more important because it has eternal consequences and eternal dividends is the internal man, the internal woman that has an eternal effect. And, and uh, so that's what we're going to look at uh, today. And this is how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 3. Today is part one, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time. I meant today to be part one and next week to be part two. Um, first service didn't work out the way I thought, so I have a feeling it's going to turn into a three-part series. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to cross the Jordan with the Israelites and Joshua. And we are going to see the promises of God, and then we are going to apply them to our own life. Because I am convinced that if we do this life God's way, we will expect and we will experience His blessings, whatever they may be. But when we do not, when we're disobedient to Him, um, you, you know what? Uh, we can't expect His blessings. And, 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 but here's the beauty of it also. He also gives us a do-over. So here we are, 2016, crossing the Jordan, crossing into 2017 with, with the Israelites. And uh, for the areas that Pastor Tom didn't do so well in 2016... I get to hit the reset, the do-over button, and so do you. But either way, we're crossing the Jordan. We're going to see what God has for us. Amen? So let's get going. Joshua chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. If you have your Bible, open up there. If you don't, maybe someone near you will share this with you. But this is what we read. Then Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. He rose early in the morning, and, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. 
he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. And so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, uh, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Wow, I love that. Joshua says, here's the word of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant is going to cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. That's where we're going. We are going to enter into the land of God's promises with Israel. The Ark of the Covenant is going first. You have not been this way before, verse 4 said. So God is going to go before us. Same thing for you and I, right? We have not been into 2017 yet. We are going. And, and man, how many of you would like to be on God's side in 2017? Oh, I mean, why, why not, right? So God's going to lead us into this land, this way that we have never been before. The Ark of the Covenant goes before the people they're following. Make sense so far? So Joshua says to the people, verse 5, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. In other words, get ready. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to be getting ready, sanctifying ourselves. Then Joshua, he spoke to the priests saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and, and they went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Verse 8, You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that He will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, a whole bunch of ites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass. As soon as the soles of the feet, check this out, verse 13. As soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, as soon as their souls shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. I love this. God is saying, you're gonna, the ark is going to go before you. The priests have the ark. They're going to stand there in the, on the edge of the Jordan River. As soon as they do that, man, the water is going to, there's going to be a, a dam that God is going to put up. You will see the water gathering as a heap. And all of Israel will be able to cross the Jordan into the land of God's fulfilled promises, into the promised land. Now, I love this because we have a lesson of faith right here. God tells the priest, you've got to step into the Jordan before the water is going to stop. Uh, that's how God does things. I want you to take a step of faith. We often say, God, when I see such and such happen, then I will go. God says, no, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be obedient to me. It might not make any sense. I mean, this wouldn't make any sense. Put your feet in the water and the water's going to stop. That's not natural, but that's what God says I'll do. God requires us to take steps of faith out of obedience and trust in him. So that's what's going on. What does he also say? When you enter into the promised land, again, they're following the Lord, right? Following the Ark of the Covenant. He will drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. In other words, he will drive out the enemy. This is miraculous. God says, you do this my way. You follow me. You take these steps of faith and obedience. And you watch. I will drive out and defeat the enemy before you. Man, I am going to do it for you. It's awesome. Let's read on. Verse 14, and so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the, uh, of the water for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. 
that the waters which came down from upstream stood still. And they rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. A pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? The dry ground, they waited, they crossed over, and that's where we are. Now check this out. I'm going to read a little bit further, all right? You guys can handle it? Good, because I'm going to keep reading anyways. <laughs> Verse 1, chapter 4, And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, look at this, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here. Out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord God in the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you shall take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean? And you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded, they took up the twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Verse 9, then we'll stop here. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So let's stop here. Man, this is exciting. Take up twelve stones. Because it is going to be a memorial to you that God is faithful. In fact, we're going to take up 12 stones today also. And as we cross the Jordan from 2016 into 2017. And by the way, today I think this is also significant. Because when you get to chapter 5, we're not going to read it right now. But when you get to chapter 5, the Israelites, they cross over the Jordan and it's the day of Passover. They celebrate Passover. Uh, today we're not going to celebrate the Jewish Passover, but we are going to celebrate our Passover. We're going to celebrate communion because Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the Passover lamb. But I, but I look at this. This is what we're going to do. We, You and I, together, we are going to cross the Jordan. And we're going to cross and we're going to set up 12 stones. Uh, I was hoping to have four stones for you today, but I found out first service I've only got enough for enough time for three stones today. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the rest maybe next week or the next two weeks. We'll see. But I, but, but I think you're going to be blessed. But before we look at these stones of remembrance and start to set them up for us, or the stones in our case, the stones of uh, internal uh, searching uh, to make sure we're right with the Lord, crossing the Jordan of 2016 and 2017, I want you to notice something with me. When Israel did things God's way, they were blessed. When they did not, they were not blessed. So check this out. In the days of Joshua, exactly that. When done God's way, Israel experienced great success. In fact, when you get to chapter 6, notice how it says, for example, Jericho up there. When you get to chapter 6, you find out this. Israel has crossed the Jordan. God says, I'm going to give you Israelites the city of Jericho. Jericho had a wall around it. And God says, this is what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to command the people. You're going you're to walk around the city, the, the city walls of Jericho for seven days. One time each day. But on the seventh day, you're walking around seven times. And this is what you're going to do on the seventh day. You're going to blow your horns. And if the walls are going to come down, you're going to get victory. Now, I want you to think about this. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Now, think about a general leading an army anywhere in the world and he says, gentlemen, I know you went to boot camp and everything, but right now I want... How many of you were in the band in high school? 
Okay, right now I want all of the band members from high school, they're going to lead us, and they're going to blow horns and beat drums, and we're going to beat the, we're, we're going to win. What would you think? I mean, seriously, come on. You'd be calling in the tanks. Get the Air Force. Give me some guns. I don't want a bunch of horns to blast. This isn't going to work. Look, you guys are staring at me like, yes, it would. No, it, it doesn't make any sense. Look at me. Does it make sense to you? We're, work with me on this. It doesn't make any sense at all. You're going to walk around a, an enemy and blow your horn and that's the victory plan? That is the victory plan. Some of you guys are looking at me like, yeah, that's what I would do every time. If I was in the band, that's what I would do. Um, I'm telling you, it, 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 well, it might make sense to you. It makes no sense to me. I mean, let me give you an example. Biblically, if you tithe, you give God 10% of your income, you keep 90. God says, I will bless you as if you had more than 100% of your income. And you're saying, well, that makes no sense to me. But if you, you tithe, you find out, wow, it's true. Things are, re it's remarkable. You find out God will do more with his 10% than you ever could have done with 100%. And you're at least scratching your head going, this makes no sense. Uh, another example is in the New Testament. Jesus has two fish, right? And five loaves from the little boy, right? And Jesus is going to feed 5,000. But this makes no sense. Because you and I know with math, what? Two plus five equals seven. But with God's math, two plus five equals 5,000 plus women and children. 15,000, 20,000. You put what you have into God's hands. It makes no sense. If I give it away, God, you're going to bless. Yes, that's a biblical principle. If I march around Jericho and blow my horn, you're going to give us victory over the enemy. That's what I'm going to do. Blow your horn. When they did this thing God's way, even when it would have made, had no logical sense whatsoever, God blessed them. However, when not done God's way, Israel experienced great failure. Uh, enter in chapter 7 of the book of Joshua. So Israel has victory over Jericho. They blow their horns. They got this crazy plan that God gave them. God gives them victory. They look at Ai, the next city they've got to conquer. Jericho was easy. We just blew horns and we won. We'll go against Ai. They didn't even pray. They had enough men. They had enough soldiers. They weren't seeking the Lord. Joshua leaves them to take Ai and they got whooped. They were defeated. Why? They weren't trusting in the Lord. They went with their own plan. They, they had brains. They had brawn. They said, man, this is an easy job. We can beat them. It did not work out that way at all. But the good news is this. God gave him a do-over. You get to chapter 8. In chapter 8 of Joshua, they went against Ai right. Joshua sought the Lord, and the Lord gave them victory. God honors His promises. He always will. Uh, but as it was with the people of Israel, so too is it uh, with His people today. Uh, back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God says, this is what I'll do. Before Joshua took the lead and while Moses was still alive, God said, this is what I'll do. If you are obedient to me, I will bless you. I'll bless your farms. I'll bless your houses. I'll bless your families. I'll bless your bank accounts. I'll bless it all. But if you are disobedient to me, I will, your farms will be ruined. Your families will be destroyed. You'll be driven out of the land. You will not find blessing, but you will find cursing. Choose who, which side you want to be on. Israel would always be God's people. He had a covenant with Abram. And, and, but he says, I will scatter you out of the promised land through the four corners of the earth. And God has done that with the Jewish people. Yet in the last days, he says, I'll bring you back. We see that happening now. Here's the thing with you and I. Same principle applies. The promises to the people of Israel are good for the Christian too. God says, if you are an obedient Christian you will see me bless in ways that you never thought you would experience. I will bless your farms. I'll bless your families. I'll bless your bank accounts. I'll bless you guys. But if you are disobedient to me, your farms won't be blessed. Your families won't be blessed. You look at the United States of America, a country that's turned from God, and it doesn't look like families aren't blessed. We have violence in the streets, and things aren't so cool. 
But here's the thing for the Christian. He still gives us a do-over. We are still God's children. He still loves us. You can still be saved but be disobedient. Did you know that? As it was with Israel, so too is it with us. God has a covenant with His Son. But we have a choice how we want to go through this life. Uh, As I mentioned in the beginning, today is the first day of the rest of your life. So you ready? 2016 is behind us. When done God's way, Israel experienced great success. When not done God's way, Israel experienced great failure. The same thing applies to us. We're going to pull 12 stones out of the Jordan. And they are internal examinations to help us make sure that we are on track for 2017. So you ready? First stone for us, stone of examination, I might call it, is personal integrity. Uh, Integrity is a good thing to have. When you blow your integrity... With anybody, it is really hard for them to ever trust you again. Um, Integrity needs to be kept. I highly recommend it as much as depends upon uh, each person as an individual. Job had integrity. You know the story of Job in the Old Testament? So so Job was the one who went through all kinds of suffering. He he lost his, his family except his wife. He lost his servants. He lost his business. He lost everything. But this is what God said about Job in Job chapter 2. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Hold fast his integrity. In fact, after this, when Job went through all of his trials and sufferings, he still held fast his integrity. But with that, what is integrity? Well, the dictionary defines integrity as a firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values, incapable of being bribed or morally corrupted. In the Bible... The Hebrew word translated integrity in the Old Testament means the condition of being without blemish, completeness, perfection, sincerity, honesty, and adheres to a pattern of good works. Integrity is truth. Uh, With that, it would be be wise to evaluate our lives in the way that is fitting with the Bible on the subject of integrity. Uh, For the person of integrity... God promises blessing. Just as He promised the children of Israel, I will bless you when you cross the Jordan into the land of fulfilled promises, the promised land. If you walk in my ways. God promises integrity to those who are His children. He promises, excuse me, blessing to those who are His children that walk in integrity. In 1 Kings chapter 9, As for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart, and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. That was a promise to David's son Solomon, and a promise to all of the kings who would follow after him. You walk in integrity, and the promises to Israel are the promises that are good for us also. You, you walk in integrity, this is what I'm going to give you. I will establish you forever. In Psalm 41, the psalmist wrote, By this I know that you delight in me, Lord. Uh, My enemy will not shout and triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Man, I love that. There are times when your enemy is giving you a bad time, whoever that may be, right? Right? And you're thinking, man, they're rejoicing over me. They're shouting over me. Victory over me. You stand fast on your integrity. God will turn it on its head. You will come out of it. God will will right the wrongs. You'll be blessed. You stand in your integrity. Let God deal with it. There are times when we are tempted to compromise. Compromise uh, in our integrity. And God says, no, you come clean. You do what you're supposed to do. We want to fudge on our taxes. Well, Lord, if I'm not, if I don't have integrity on my taxes, I'll get more money. Um, if I don't have integrity, then 
if I do have integrity, man, I'm going to be in all kinds of trouble. God says, no, you walk with me. You walk in integrity. Let me prove to you that I will bless you. Sometimes God's ways don't make sense to us. We start to reason and figure and scheme our way through this. And he says, what are you going to do? You're going to trust in the government? You're going to trust in yourself? Or are you going to trust in me? Or to put it another way, you're going to trust in the IRS? Or yourself? Or the Lord? Amen. I will trust in the Lord. I will walk in integrity. And when it doesn't make sense, it did not make sense, even though a lot of you seem to think it did, that the Israelites would march around Jericho and blow their horns and get victory. It doesn't always make sense to walk even in integrity. God says, you do it, man. I'll, I'll, let me show you what I'll do. But not only that, the Bible tells us, whoever walks in integrity will be delivered, but he who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. Listen, man, there are times when I cannot see my way through a, a, a subject, a circumstance, whatever it is. He says, you stand firm in, in, in integrity, and you watch what I will do. Man, you will be delivered. might not seem to it like it today. You will be delivered. It will happen. Let me tell you, since I brought up the IRS, um, <laughs> this goes back to the 1980s. Back early 80s, I had this gardening and landscape service. I hope I have enough time to tell you this. And, and, and anyways, I, I didn't pay my taxes for years, right? So I suddenly become a Christian. And my brother was a CPA and says, I tell him, he goes, my brother wasn't a Christian, but he was very upright. You know what I mean? He's like, you, you, you live by the letter of the law. And he goes, you have to, you have to get this right. You got to turn yourself in. So he helped me to get all the filings done. It's like seven or eight years of taxes. I'm thinking I'm dead forever. And you know what? It was, it, was, it was rough. I'll just tell you ahead of time. It was rough, but I felt like I'm a Christian and I have to do what's right. right. Walk in my integrity. You'll be delivered. I go down to the IRS building in downtown Santa Ana, and I've got the stack of papers that my brother prepared for me. I, seriously, this happened. I turned in the stack of papers. They said, what are you doing here? And, and I said, um, it was at the federal building in, in there, and I said, well, I haven't filed taxes in the next amount of years, and I want to get right with you. And th this person takes the papers, and they look at me, well, what would you do for a living? And I said, told them I was doing landscaping and gardening and so forth. And, and uh, they started chuckling. They went and told one of their friends. I'm standing there. They got my papers. I'm standing there, and their friend comes over, and they start laughing. They go, we never would have caught someone like you. I literally tried to reach over the counter and grab my papers back. Because I thought they didn't, I wasn't in the system yet. And I, I it was just out of my reach. I, but you know what? I walked away from there thinking I could have gotten away with it. It could have gotten away with it. I'm walking through the hard concrete of Santa Ana, shaking my head. And God brought a verse to my memory, Psalm 84, verse 11. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That listen, I paid back the IRS. It took a long time, but God blessed. It was strange. I was making like minimum wage, and he's and the money was taken out of my account every month. But God blessed, and, and, and I never forgot that lesson. Obviously, uh, it was a little bit painful, but it's worth it. You walk in integrity, God will deliver you. Crooked ways, you will suddenly fall. The second stone is is a disciplined life. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes and says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Let me stop for just a second. Godless myths and old wives' tales? Uh, there's crazy stuff that's out there in the world that, that, is, that people claim is Christian and biblical. And you hear it, and it itches your ears, and you're thinking, that sounds so good. And the preacher, give me 50% of your income, and man, you'll be like Donald Trump. You'll be a billionaire. 40%, you'll be something else. 30%, you're still going to be doing good. Whatever you do, just give it all to me, right? And uh, crazy things, but you hear these kind of things. I, I remember hearing the story one time. It was Pastor Chuck Smith who said that he received this letter and uh, if you sent it, uh, this guy X amount of dollars, you'd receive a miracle wallet. And, and with this miracle wallet, seriously, you would like put in a dollar and multiply it by 10 or whatever it was. Put in a $10 bill into your wallet. You open it up and there's 100 bucks in there. It's a miracle wallet. And then at the end of the letter, apparently the guy said, but our ministry is really hurting right now for money. So he sent him a letter. He said, why don't you use your own miracle wallet? Uh, but I mean, you look at it, right? I mean, you reason through these things. You know what I mean? 
Don't believe this crazy stuff. Train yourself in the Word of the Lord to walk upright. What else? About discipline? Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain the prize. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable prize, but we do it imperishable. They do it to receive uh, an award now. You, you, you win the marathon. Praise the Lord. That's awesome, right? I know there's probably a lot of people here that, that do that sort of thing. That's fantastic. My body doesn't work that way. Blueberry scones, as I mentioned earlier. Now, that looked good. <laughs> But, but either way, it's a perishable price. It's, gonna, it's not going to last forever. We run the race, the spiritual race, for that which lasts forever. Man. Wow. So I do not run aimlessly, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And then Paul also said in Philippians, I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. I love that. All of us who are mature. The immature Christian is living for the things of this world. That's what that's saying. The mature Christian has a view of truth. I'm going to die. Everything I have, I will give an account for. Everything I have, everything I do, everything I say. Man, what do I want to do? I want to live for that which is imperishable. I want to live for the place I am going. One day I'm going to be home in glory. One day I'm going to be at the place where the street is paved with gold. I'm going to be at that place where there is the river of life and the tree of life forever and ever and ever. This life is passing away. The mature will have a view of such things that's right. And we will view the things of this world as passing away because they are. The richest person in the world will die. Just as the poorest person. And they are going to die exactly the same. You want to know how? Poor, without a penny, and naked. And then what? They will stand before the Lord. The mature will understand these things and have the right view. Uh, let's move on to the last stone for today. Um, it's this one. It's regular Bible reading and, and devotions. Uh, let, let, me, let me say this. As a pastor, um, sometimes it's really easy for me to get caught up or tempted to be caught up because I read the Bible every day, whether I read it for this or I read it for uh, Bible prophecy or just read to study whatever it is filling my head. It's really easy for me to just read for the purpose of study and to give out. Real easy. And to justify it, to, the temptation is to justify not doing my devotions because I'm in the Bible all day long. I have conversations with people about the Bible all day long. In fact, people who don't even know the Lord but know me will ask me questions about the Bible. So my questions or the things I deal with all day long are about the Bible. So it's really easy for me to be tempted and... Say, I, I don't really need to do my devotions. Yes, I do. I must do them. And, and I'm going to confess to you, sometimes I'm not perfect in this regard. Now, my wife seems to be perfect, and I don't get it. But, but sometimes I'm not. And God will convict me that I need His Word for me. I need Him to speak to me, not for me to have it for the purpose of going out. But I, I, I need it for my own soul, for my own strength, because He will minister to me in really neat ways, just like He will to you when you are doing your regular Bible reading. In fact, this message today wasn't intended to come along at all, by my knowledge, but I was doing my devotion. I was in the book of Joshua, and these things started coming to me for a personal life, and I thought, I'll share this for the new year. This will be great. So you get to enter into my devotional life. That's, what, that's what's going on with today in, in the next week or two. But if I look at this school, this is what I want to encourage you to do. Sometimes reading through your Bible is a difficult thing. I, I have a, this Bible here. It's a one-year Bible. 
And, and I go through it. A friend of mine bought this for me several years ago, but I've had various one-year Bibles, different translations and so forth. Uh, the very first one-year Bible I had was back in 1988. I remember I was listening to Greg Laurie on the radio as a fairly new believer, and I'm listening to him on the radio, and if, if you gave a donation of any size, and they would send you this one-year Bible. And I got my very first one, and I read it that year, and, and the next year, and I would go through it. Man, this is great. It has an automatic Bible reading plan to get you through the Bible in one year, 15 minutes a day. It is fantastic. Some people will say something like, well, I read the Bible, but I don't get anything out of it. You know what I would say? Keep reading anyways. They said, my mind works like a sieve. Things just go right on through and they'll stay. This is what you'll have. If you don't get much out of it, at least you'll have a clean sieve, right? (laughs) Everything's going through and you will. My first two years of reading the Bible... I couldn't remember anything. My head was so messed up from the things I did in my past life. I couldn't remember anything. I would go to church and not remember anything. But doing it over and over. Listen, sometimes in my, my devotion, I'm only reading a few verses and saying, Lord, this, and I just start meditating on things that God has shown me. He will bless you. He will bless you. In Psalm 119, uh, how can a young man, uh, a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Elsewhere in Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote, I would have perished in my affliction. I would have perished in my trial, my tribulation, my my great time of pain. When I lost my loved one, did I not hope in your word? Your word is life. Your word is light. His word will lead us in the dark places, in the difficult times in this life. And that, that personal reading, the personal devotion, will minister to you and strengthen you in a way that if you've never done it before, that you have no idea what you're about to experience. If you say, you know what, this thing I'm going to do, He will bless your socks off. Which could be weird if your socks came off, but that's another story. (laughs) Let me move on. (laughs) Things pop in my head, and sometimes they just come out. You know what I mean? (laughs) You should see third service. That's when things get really weird. Anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the person, the servant, the man, the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, this is one of my favorite passages. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. I would encourage you, a daily, a a, a Bible like this to go through, a daily Bible reading plan. We have men's and women's Bible studies where you get into the Word on a daily basis. The life groups get into these things. His Word is truth. His Word is life. Uh, Something else to think about regarding His Word. Um, You want to be smart? You want to be real smart? This is what the Bible teaches us. Psalm 119, verse 98. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. Uh, I got proof. Me. The fact that I do this is really weird. Especially if you all, anybody in here would have known me in years past, you would have said, there is no way, there's no hope for that person. I'll illustrate this a little bit further for you. The very first funeral service I ever did was for a friend of mine from high school that died from AIDS. I wasn't a pastor yet, but the family asked me to do the service, so I did. And and, uh, the only family members that knew he had died from AIDS at that point was my, well, just myself and the family members. None of the friends knew that, but I, I ministered at the funeral, officiated it. I was dressed kind of like I am right now. And uh, one of my friends from high school, by that time, I think I was about uh, 35 years old or so. Uh, but this uh, friend of mine from high school, his mom was at the funeral. And she comes up to me afterwards and she looks at me and she says, Tommy Hughes? 
is that you? It can't be Tommy Hughes. I mean, she looked at me as if there's nothing good that's ever going to come out of this kid that's friends with my son. I, it, it can't be. Um, back when I went to high school, we didn't have, in our yearbook, we didn't have that section that said things like most beautiful, most likely to succeed, smartest, you know, those kind of things. Uh, if we did and they had a section for most unlikely to succeed, it would have been me. So, I mean, I look at this and I go, this is crazy, Lord, that you have actually given me wisdom in your word. And sometimes I look at things and I go, wow, you actually do make me sound smarter than I really am. Well, you are good. But that's what he promises. And he will guide us. Let me show you one thing and then we're going to go to our Passover, the communion time. Check this out in Acts chapter 4. This is the last thing. Uh, Peter and John are arrested and they're addressing the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, they're explaining to the Sanhedrin, they say there's salvation in no other name. There's no other name under heaven by which you might be saved. And so the Sanhedrin are baffled by these two guys, Peter and John. They can't figure it out. These guys sound smart. They're bold. Verse 13, they say this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, Acts 4, verse 13, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were ignorant. They didn't go to Harvard. They didn't even graduate from high school. And they're untrained in even the religious things. They're fishermen. They smelled bad. They lived in Galilee, the low life. That's where they lived. They marveled. And they realized that these men had been with Jesus. This is what God does. I'm often asked, Pastor Tom, where did you get your biblical education? And, and I've said before, in the school of hard knocks. And uh, you know, I've, I've gone to school of ministry and, and lots of those kind of things. But they want to know, did, did you graduate with your doctorate degree from some high-ranking theological seminary on the East Coast? You know, where the smart people are. So now I was just an ignorant fisherman. This is what people see when you are in His Word. They see that you have been with Jesus. Amen? Now, here's the deal. Like I said, I had 12 stones. I intended to get to the next one today and the rest next week. We've got nine left. I don't know when we're going to finish them all, but you want to know what we're going to see next week? It's going to be um, a stone of, of this one. Having an uncritical love of others. I know half of you are thinking, I ain't coming back next week. I like being critical of other people. Listen, it'll be great. We're going to learn. It'll be in reach and outreach as we lay the rest of these stones as we have crossed the Jordan from 2016 into 2017. Amen?